Okay, I'm going to do kind of a unique video today. I'm actually going to talk about my resume, if you will, my uh, past jobs that I've had. Uh, what do I do for a living? Okay, and I'm doing this for two reasons. Number one, of course, is to answer people who accuse me of not wanting to work or something for a living and I'm lazy and whatever else. And you say, well, you know, you don't need to answer those people. I, I know that. I know I don't really have to answer them. I mean, the Lord, if you're saved, you understand what this ministry is about, what this ministry is doing, and what this ministry has accomplished. And I give all the glory to the Lord for that, not on me. But uh, I'm doing this for the new believer that, that comes along and they hear these accusations against me, that I'm lazy and things like that. Um, I'm going to show you what the Bible says in the second part of this study. I'm going to, uh, if you want to call it a study, it's more of a testimony type of a thing. I'm going to show you the scriptures that talk about a man in ministry being paid. So we're going to get into that. But uh, the other reason I'm doing this study is because there are a lot of young men out there that get very fervent for the Lord. They want to serve the Lord with their lives, which is great. Praise the Lord for that. But they want to go right into ministry as teenagers. Uh, there's a very big danger in that. The Bible talks about a novice. He can be lifted up with pride and he falls into the condemnation and snare of the devil. All right, uh, you're not supposed to be a novice. And I don't care how much you love the Lord and how much you study the Word and everything else. Uh, being a novice is not an insult. It's just simply a time period of your life where you need to learn some things. And I do not recommend that anybody in their early teens or early 20s goes into ministry uh, as far as full time. Now, of course, you can have ministry and, and witness to people and do things for the Lord. That's great. Absolutely. Um, serve the Lord with your life. Yes. But full-time ministry in terms of being a uh, preacher, a teacher of God's Word, a pastor, a bishop, whatever you want to call it, you need to be older. You need to go through some things. And I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to go through these jobs that I've had. I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to show a lot of pictures. Um, it's going to be kind of a, I, you know, I did my testimony years and years ago, and I've, I've had to redo it because I was confused about some things in the past, and I've, I've since uh, repented. <laughs> of um, some of the things that I've, you know, was in my original testimony. I, I was saying, just to give you a little thing here, I was saying that I got saved as a, as a boy in Sunday school. I did not get saved. Okay, that was not true conversion. It was false. Okay, my salvation came when I was 25 years old. So um, that's why I'm going to redo the testimony. But I thought instead of doing just a big, you know, three-hour testimony or something, I'm going to split it up into different sections. So this is going to be part of my testimony, the thing of my working past, what I've done for a living uh, since I started to work. So the first part of this little video here is going to be my job past, what I've done, how I started working in the secular world, the different jobs that I've had. I've definitely had some unique experiences in the working world. Um, I'm going to be relating those. and Like I said, I'm going to be showing a lot of pictures from my own personal photo album stuff online, things like that. So it's uh, going to be pretty neat. Some of you are probably going to be interested. If you're not, then watch something else. Plenty of junk on YouTube to watch. But uh, the second part of this study is going to be getting into the scriptures of why you support a man in ministry, what the importance of it is. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about what goes on here, what our goals are, what uh, what we've done in the past, what we're doing presently, what we're going to be doing in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Um, this is for, uh, the second part's more for the people that want to support this ministry, why you should. Um, okay, so that's what that's going to be about. It's kind of weird because I actually, as I was writing the notes, I just wrote a couple here on this little tablet. I didn't even realize this until here, you know, just doing the notes for this. I've actually had seven jobs. The seventh being where I'm currently at, King James Video Ministries. Okay, this isn't just, you know, again, let me say that. This isn't just me flippantly doing this thing here on YouTube. YouTube is an extension of King James Video Ministries. That's the real ministry. It's not uh, Husky 394 XP, which there's a tie in there too, which we'll be looking at today. I'm going to show you the proof of my logging past. But, uh, you know... Brian Denlinger is not just a YouTube personality, okay? Uh, some guy that has a webcam or even prosumer cameras that I use and audio equipment and stuff. Uh, YouTube is not it. It's King James Video Ministries. 
King James Video Ministries has existed now since 2008. Um, so even before I got on YouTube, King James Video Ministries was there. Um, so we're going to talk about this. How did it all start? Well, uh, in the summer, I guess, of 1989, um, when I got out of uh, school and I uh, was going to Peckway Valley High School at the time. Well, that's where I graduated from. And um, when I was 14 years old, I wanted to get a summer job to earn a little bit of extra money. So I went to a historic uh, railroad in the area. It's called Strasburg Railroad down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, just outside of Strasburg, the town of Strasburg. You go down 741, Route 741, leaving Strasburg. And um, you go down there, it's, it would be on the left when you go out of Strasburg. Strasburg Railroad on the left, the uh, Railroad Museum on the right. And there's a whole, it's like a whole area dedicated to trains and everything else down there because it, it was an old uh, freight line, I think 1830 or something like that. I mean, it goes way back. Very, very old historic railroad down there. So uh, it's, it's, it's neat that they've, they've kept it going and things. But uh, what they do is they have real, true steam engines. And I'll show you some pictures here. Um, a lot of different steam engines and things, and they they still operate the same freight line that goes from Strasburg to a little town of Paradise. And uh, my father was actually raised in Soudersburg, which is not too far from Paradise. So he went and he watched the steam engine when he was a boy. I mean, it, this thing goes way, way, way back. So uh, you know, it's I I grew up on uh, Peach Lane, like kind of Strasburg Railroads down in here, and then you go up the valley up on top of the one ridge and uh, the one hill and uh, I could hear the steam engine the whistle going you know I could hear it uh, growing up and uh, so and I heard it you know, quite a few hundreds of times uh, all the years that I worked there I worked there for five years at the Stratford Railroad but anyhow what happened is I went in and there was a dining car restaurant is what they called it. It was a, there at the Strasburg Railroad. They built a tourist attraction around the railroad freight train, freight line thing there. And they built a bunch of different things. They had gift shop and, you know, photo booth and, and different little touristy things. And then, of course, they had a restaurant. And so I got a job as my first job was a bus boy. Okay. In other words, I would clean tables. I would go out and I'd get the trays. You'd go up. You know, when you go into the Strasburg Railroad dining car restaurant, you'd go in there and you'd make, you know, do your order. And they give you this tray, this uh, dark brown rectangular tray. And then they'd put your food on that and, and your soda and whatever else that you wanted. And then you'd go sit down and you'd eat. Well, it was my job. When those people were done, they'd take their tray up and they'd put the trash into the trash can and put the tray up on top. So my job was go clean the tables and go out and get the trays and clean those. And so I'll show you a little picture here. This is, I had to search for a picture. I couldn't even find one. It's been totally changed now, which is pretty sad. But the dining car restaurant's different today than it was back when I was working there. But they had a promotional video from back in the 1990s, I think it was. And uh, they showed the restaurant the way it was when I was there. So this is a picture of it. I'll show you here with some little arrows where uh, this is where I would stand here. Um, back in there, that's where I would wash the trays and everything, wipe them down. And um, here this glass case was where they had the ice cream at. And then you can see the soda dispenser here. And that's where the, the counter was. And you give your order. And so that's how I started. I started uh, bussing tables, you know, and, and I'd go out there and, and uh, I'd have to change the, the trash bags, you know, empty the trash bags and stuff, take that out back to the trash area. And then, of course, occasionally I'd have to take the trash, carry it down to the dumpster down at the far end of the Strasburg Railroad uh, complex, if you will. And um, so I had to, different duties like that. And, of course, if people needed um, ice, you know, for the soda machines and things, I'd have to fill that. And, and just different little duties like that. And um, from the very beginning... I had a very strong work ethic, which I'm thankful for. I had to do a lot of chores growing up, um, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, certainly my parents made plenty of mistakes, but that's one thing that they did right. They gave me a good, strong work ethic. So I had that, and I worked very hard. A lot of times when there were teenagers standing around and goofing off because there was, it wasn't busy, there were no customers, it'd be a rainy day, kind of dark and dreary, and nobody wanted to be out riding the train that day, so it'd be just like nothing to do all day. 
well, I'd just go out and I'd clean the tables and I, okay, I didn't get to clean this area here and I'd, I'd take it apart and I'd clean it and stuff. And, and um, what happened is the bosses there took notice of that. And so it wasn't too long before I was upgraded from busboy to now working at the cash register. And uh, I didn't really like that job very much because you were dealing with people all day. Sometimes hundreds of people would come in there and they would just be, the place would be packed and just, and you deal with people and uh, kind of a funny story. I'll tell this story. Uh, <laughs> there was a, there was a big group of uh, black people from down South. And uh, they, I remember they, this one guy, you know, young guy, and he had this really strong Southern accent. And, you know, I've worked with black people and stuff, you know, I guy I work with, I'll be telling this story here in a little bit, um, but uh, he was black, he was from down south from Georgia, you know, and he had the accent and everything, and, and I was just like, sometimes he'd say stuff, and I'd go, what? And he'd, you know, he'd laugh about it and stuff, give me a hard time, you know, and, and uh, we had a good uh, friendship, but uh, anyhow, uh, so this guy comes up, and I'm standing there, there at the cash register, and I say, hello, sir, can I help you? And he goes, I want blue ride Beth, does he? And I'm like, uh, excuse me, blue ride bed, lily. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> I'm just like, Ex uh, excuse me. <laughs> I started getting embarrassed. The guy got mad at me. He finally goes, uh, blue raspberry slushy. And I'm like, oh, blue raspberry slushy. Oh yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> oh boy, felt dumb, but uh, so that's what he wanted. But, you know, I, I dealt with that. You get all these people, different accents. You get the New England accent. You get down south. You get people from other countries even would come to the Strasburg Railroad and they'd broken English, you know. And, oh, I used to dread that. Working working at these cash registers, you know, and you'd get, having to get the orders and everything else. So from there, I went from the cash register to working actually back in the kitchen. I would be back there flipping hamburgers and stuff and, and uh, you know, cooking food and, and everything. And uh, again, why was I advancing? Why did I go from busboy to cash register back to the cooking area where the older teens went? They didn't just have the young people back in there. It was usually older people. And in fact, a lot of adults that worked there at the Strasburg Railroad were working back in there. They didn't have young people like me uh, many times. Why did I go back there? Because I had a strong work ethic. And if you want to advance in any job, have a strong work ethic, especially if you're a young person and you're saved. Um, make sure that you work hard. Uh, do that, you know, you're working as unto the Lord. You have a testimony. So I went back and I started cooking back there in the kitchen area. And uh, again, a lot of interesting stories and things there. Uh, we would, I remember the one time um, I was making ice cream cones. They had a malted waffle. You know, they, they, you make these ice cream cones and you, you uh, or the, not the ice cream cones, but the, you'd pour the, waffle mix this malted mix onto these waffle irons and then you'd pull the thing down and it would shh, you know and it would ding and then you'd lift it up and you'd peel off this you know moist waffle in a in a circle and then you you twist it into a cone shape and then it would dry like that and it'd get hard you know and that's where you get your waffle cones at <clears throat> you know and um i still have the scar to this day you can't see it here but it's it's uh you know maybe i can show it to you on the overhead camera here if I can zoom in. Yeah, it's not really showing up. It's right there. You can kind of see it right there on my arm. But uh, I remember this one day. Um, I'm there, you know, putting the batter on these, these waff iron things, pulling the next one down, pour some more batter on, pull it down. And something fell in behind the thing, and I reached back in like this, and somebody called my name, and I went like that. And when I did, I, I moved my arm, and right against that waffle iron. felt really good. So uh, it's always a joy to get scars from your workplace. But uh, it builds character. So anyhow, I was working there at the Strasburg Railroad as a cook. Well, uh, they were working on a car a train car, a fancy one that they were fixing it up to make it look like an old-time dining car. It was called the Lee E. Brenner car. I'll show a picture of it here, the interior and things. And basically, it served food. Um, and they were looking for somebody that could go up and work on that train. 
And I was the very first young person to ever work on that train. Oh, there was all adults and things that, that worked there. They cooked there and things. And uh, they trusted me enough by that point to put me up on that train. And actually before I'd done that, there was another, they, they would have the, um, oh, uh, can't think of the name of the car. It was another one of the fancy cars that was more expensive, the Marion or something like that. But anyways, they had the governor of the state, uh, Bob Casey at the time, actually rode the train and I was myself and Keith Schmid who was kind of one of the owners of the dining car restaurant um, we were the cooks so I actually got to cook for the governor of the state of Pennsylvania um, ham with a pineapple ring and green beans and uh, apple pie and I forget what else but um, they put me on the train there and so I was on this Lee Brenner car and we would do, you know, probably eight trips a day or something like that, six to eight trips a day, depending on how many hours I was working. And it was, you know, full-time job too, by the way, in the summer there, the summer months when I was not in, in school. And, uh, you know, so I rode the train, I don't even know how many times, hundreds of times, you know, Strasburg to Paradise, Strasburg to Paradise, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, but this train car, um, it was, you know, dark on the outside and, and things and, uh, I think it's it's like a dark red now, like a maroon. But when I was working there, it was dark brown. I remember that. But um, it's dark brown, had a black metal roof. And then the kitchen area was like, it was all stainless steel line and everything. And, and you had all the different things in there. Uh, a lot of it was just um, kind of warming areas where you had stainless steel containers that went down into hot water. And then that hot water kept the bottom of the container warm and it kept the food warm. And... Uh, you know, and then they had a, a this toaster oven thing that it would you'd put slices of bread in, and it would toast them, and then you'd make club sandwiches with that. And there was like a little refrigerator under there, and and there were convection ovens behind that area and stuff. You know, and and this is all you're cooking while the train's going, so you're doing this as you're going down the tracks, and you're going to go like rocking back and forth with the the motions of the train uh, while you're cooking stuff. And and um, I remember this one time. Uh, this woman that was cooking, she was working there at the Strasburg Railroad, and uh, she was kind of a big, heavy set woman. And I would usually, when we the train to come back to the station, you had 15 minutes to go back down to the restaurant for supplies and come back up to the train. And so I usually did it because I was, you know, tall and skinny, and I could run like a deer back then. And uh, and so I would usually go down and get it, and she, and she was like, I'll go down this time. Don't worry about it. Well, she didn't get back in time, and the train pulls out, and there were 45 people on that train, and I had to serve them in basically a half hour. <laughs> well, half hour to an hour, somewhere in there, um, you know, because you got to serve them before they get back to the station, you know, is the point I'm trying to make. It was basically an hour ride, uh, 45 minutes technically. But uh, so I had 45 people to serve in that amount of time so I was able to do it uh, but some crazy times on that train but uh, anyhow I worked there till 1994 is the year I graduated from high school from Peckway Valley High School and it was a tourist attraction so uh, at the time I was like well there's no health insurance in hindsight that was actually a good thing but uh, it was just you know it was it was a place where you could work and you know it was very busy in the summer months but then they shut down in the winter so I'm like, well, this obviously can't be my full-time job. Uh, I, I liked it there. I liked the people. I had a good time working there. It was very, very busy, very active kind of a job. Uh, there wasn't much downtime, which I, I really liked. But I realized I needed something more permanent than that. So upon graduation, I worked there for the summer, but I was looking for a job. I wasn't about to go to some university and spend more time, you know, sitting at a desk reading books and things like that. I did. I had no interest in that. Um, by that time, I was very, very much into fast cars, motorcycles, you know, on and off road motorcycles, uh, ATVs, all kinds of stuff like that. So I had to have money to, to fuel my hobby. And I'm going to be doing a video at some point in time in the future on another aspect of my testimony that talks about my vehicle past. Uh, just again to show kind of the folly of going into the debt and fast cars and all that other stuff. So another thing, but um, I know I knew I needed another job, one that would be full time year round. I wouldn't have to worry about 
seasonal work and things like that. So, um, I should mention too, by the way, during my high school years, during the winter months, I was also working when I was not in high school. In other words, like when I'd get out of school at three o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon, I'd go to a job. So I was working even during high school when I was driving and things like that. Um, the first place I worked along with the Strasburg Railroad, Strasburg Railroad in, in the summer and then this place in the winter months was a place called Timberline Lodge. It was actually not too far from where I grew up at, at Peach Lane there down in Ronks outside of Strasburg. And Timberline Lodge at the time was a very, very high class restaurant, extremely high class, really expensive food. They had a bar and stuff too and, and um, I worked there as a, as a dishwasher. So again, you know, working at jobs that are not really a uh, high society type of, you know, <laughs> jobs, that's a good place to start out. Don't think that you have to have the very best job right away. Work your way up. The other place I worked uh, during my high school years, mostly towards the later part of my high school years, I worked there for a couple months, was uh, up in Hinkletown. I would drive up there, actually drive over to New Holland and pick up my brother-in-law. And then the two of us would work for this place in the evening for a couple hours. It was uh, Snyder's Crafts is what it was called. It was a Mennonite guy named John Snyder. They had, uh, they made woodworking and stuff like that, uh, little um, jelly cabinets and little nightstands and things like that. Nothing real big furniture-wise, but I worked for him as well during high school. And actually the one time he, he needed some help delivering some tables, different places and things, and, and uh, he asked if I'd, you know, play hooky, so to speak, from school, from high school, which I was very glad to do. And uh, so I went and I actually made money that day and, and uh, just didn't show up at high school. So, but, um, so I worked Strasburg Railroad and I worked at Timberline Lodge and Snyder's Crafts. Ironically, uh, Timberline Lodge now is some kind of a Babel building or something. That was, they closed it down uh, after I had left there and now it's some Babel building bought it or something. So it's, I can't get pictures of that either. But uh, upon graduation, I worked for the Strasburg Railroad for that summer and then I went and I worked for uh, Susquehanna Sante Boat Works. A man at the Babel building I grew up at, um, Sam Spencer was his name. Uh, he was working at Susquehanna Sante Boat Works and he was like, oh, they're looking for a young guy. So I was like, you know, hey, put a good word in for me. And so he did. And I got an interview and I went in and they hired me. Uh, oh, and by the way, I started at, Sus or at the uh, Strasburg Railroad. I started at $4.25 an hour is what I started at. Um, when I went to the boat place, Susquehanna Sante Boat Works, I started, I think it was $7 an hour. So, and, and you know, it was 1989 when I started at the railroad. When I started at the boat place, it was uh, 1994 you know, late 1994. I, well, I shouldn't say late, but the fall of 1994. And I was there for three years, essentially, which I'll describe in a minute or two here. But um, <clears throat> it was over in Willow Street, Pennsylvania. And uh, basically there was Mellinger Manufacturing. If you go through Willow Street, I forget the name of the road, but you go, you go through Willow Street, uh, Kendig Square is on, would be on your left. You're heading through Willow Street and down on the right, you know, uh, if you know where Kendig Square is, if you've ever been to that area, you can basically see down to Mellinger Manufacturing. And behind there is another, it's like a airport hangar kind of a thing, and um, is what it looks like, you know, the half round building, it's kind of long, is the Susquehanna Sante Boat Works. And they built pontoon boats. And I'll show you a couple pictures actually of this um, place. But uh, I went there and they, they worked a lot in aluminum and fiberglass, building these boats and things. I have some personal pictures here too. I'm not going to be showing just family stuff and whatever. But uh, let's see if I can find that other photo. I know there's another picture of it in here somewhere. A little bit better picture of the inside of the building. But, um, oh, there it is. Okay. Let me zoom in here to this picture. My photo album. Um, right there is the interior of the boat works place. 
Uh, you can see right here, welding equipment, this thing was on wheels and it'd move around and stuff so you could weld these different boats. This was a house boat that they were building. Uh, the guy that owned this place, uh, Dale Mellinger, he was, uh, they were Mennonites, the Mellingers. And uh, he didn't like to throw stuff out, quite frugal, but a uh, very intelligent man, very, really knew how to build a lot of things. But we had these big pallets of, these are aluminum stringers that you'd put, you'd put first the pontoons. We made everything there as far as the pontoons were made on a, on a jig back in here that rolled, you know, we'd first, we'd get the aluminum sheet and we'd roll it into a circle and then we would weld the top of it. Not me, I wasn't the welder, but we had a welder there. Uh, Steve was his name. It was the black eye I was mentioning earlier and uh, um, from down south, but we'd weld these pontoons and then you'd bring them up. They'd have kind of a uh, kind of an L type of shape channel on top of them. And then these aluminum stringers here, you'd bolt those across perpendicular to the to the uh, pontoons. Then you'd screw down um, marine grade three quarter inch plywood on top of that. Then you build the boat on top of that. But uh, this was a up here. This is a mold that they had for you fiberglass that, and then you'd have fiberglass pontoons. These uh, pallets here of these big cardboard boxes that was uh, upholstered furniture for on the boats. And there was, you know, this over here was a tool shelf area. This was the, these doors would come up and down these big bay doors and we'd open them up in the summertime. And these concrete floors here supposedly, well, they, they didn't, not supposedly, I shouldn't say, but they have, they had pipes in them with water in them. Then they had a big boiler thing back in the break room, which was back here in the back. And they were, the, the boiler was supposed to heat up this whole thing. Uh, so it would stay warm in the winter time. Well, it didn't always work <laughs> and it leaked a lot of times So a lot of times we didn't have any heat in the winter time um, So it got kind of cold but and this up in here is the bad thing one of the many bad things uh, This is this fuzzy look here is asbestos This whole building was lined with asbestos and there were times that you'd be working and it would just be like You'd see the asbestos particles floating down real nice and safe place to work um, we also worked, there was no exhaust, uh, so the uh, aluminum, when it was being welded, when it was being cut, I'll show you how we cut it here in a minute. Um, when it was, when we were working with aluminum, there was no exhaust, we were breathing that stuff in. Uh, if you know anything about that, that leads to Alzheimer's. It's real good. Um, we also did fiberglassing, and again, no exhaust. So there were times that I, we were fiberglassing and I'd come home and people could smell fiberglass coming out of, you know, I'd, I'd be breathing and they could smell the fiberglass. They're like, what's that smell? They're like, oh, it's probably the fiberglass. You know, it just very, very, very toxic. Another thing that we would do is we would undercoat the pontoons. Now, I remember this one time we're like undercoating these pontoons with this really crazy uh, paint. I didn't even know it at the time. It was really, really dangerous stuff. Really, really toxic. And this guy came in and he's like, you know, he looks at the boats or the pontoons after we've, we've undercoated them. And he's like, where do you guys do your undercoating? He's like, do you have another building, you know, with, do you put, you know, where you do your painting? And we were like, no, we just kind of put it on. And he's like, do you realize how toxic that stuff is? He said, there's very few companies that even put this stuff on and they have special spray booths and the guys wear full chemical body suits to put this stuff on. It's like totally toxic. And there I'm, you know, I'm standing, I got a t-shirt on and it's got little specks of paint from this stuff. So what happened is, um, after a short time there, I, my appendix totally burst. And I had to go to the hospital and things. And while in the hospital, work was kind of slow here. So they said, just, you know, we're just going to temporarily lay you off. We'll bring you back, which I did. If I'd had enough sense, I'd have left then. But uh, extremely toxic. And I just rely on the Lord, you know, to cure me for my years of, of my three years, essentially it's more like two and a half years of just health being destroyed at that place is really, really bad. I'll show you another picture here of me inside there. You can see, I don't have a beard at this point. That was my nephew. They came to see me the one day at my job here, but this is the kind of boat that we would build. And, um, you know, this, uh, ladder, I forget where they put these ladders at these steps and stuff that they'd put on. But, uh, you know, these pontoon boats, they're, they were made for the Baltimore Harbor. And, um, you know, we would make the, put the windows in and we put all this aluminum sheet metal on the outside. And we put the 
chairs on the inside and the carpet down and whatever else we had to do. Um, but they were about 54 foot long boats is about what they were. But this here is a plasma cutter and um, works off of electricity and things. And you would use that to cut aluminum sheet metal and things. You'd use it to cut through aluminum, uh, pretty thick aluminum. And I remember the one time I was using that thing, I was cutting some aluminum sheet metal and it actually, uh, a little, not a spark, but like a little glob or whatever of molten aluminum actually went up, went inside my nose. <laughs> that hurt a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we, we had a good time there. Uh, the guys that worked there, we had, you know, a lot of fun together and stuff. It was a very small shop. It was uh, Dale Mellinger back in the office, uh, his son-in-law and a secretary out in the shop. It was myself, Sam Spencer, uh, and Steve Cozy. And then later on, it was a guy named Jack Tomlinson. And we were building these 54-foot boats. No blueprints, no, you know... Just kind of like this goes there, that goes there. There are many, many times that they were, uh, they didn't get parts in on time. So we were like, you know, can you build the roof before you build the walls or something like this? It, it was very, very messed up. And, and what ended up happening is it really kind of, uh, I went, it was a weird thing going from the Strasburg Railroad where it was just busy, busy, busy all the time to now you're standing around going, we're waiting for parts to come in. And it, it was like, you know, don't clean this up or don't clean that up because we got plans for this or we got plans for that. It, it was just, it was kind of weird. But um, that was kind of an odd place to work. But uh, what happened is, um, after I had been there for a while, uh, this problem just was getting worse and worse. I mean, we were, it, originally when I came there, Jack Tomlinson was not there and Jack was one of those guys that was born with a wrench in his hand kind of a deal. I mean, the guy had an incredible mechanical aptitude, very, very intelligent man. And he came in as the foreman of the shop. And uh, it was taking about three months to build one of the big boats and a couple of weeks to build a small, like a 17 foot to 21 foot, uh, just like personal pontoon boat for families and things. And um, when Jack came, things changed. And all of a sudden we were building those boats uh, the big ones, we were building them in a month instead of three months. And the little ones, we were building them in a matter of days. Uh, the one time, I think it took us like two days to build a small boat. I mean, the whole thing, pff, done. Carpet on the thing, all the upholstery, everything. So, I mean, he really revolutionized things. So, uh, but this son-in-law mostly, and it was back in the office thing, he was, he was something else. And... A lot of times they were getting orders and they weren't ordering parts on time and, and it was just it was some big problems there. And um, so this one day, I remember we're all out there in the shop and uh, Sam Spencer had not, he had left at that point and uh, he retired and um, there was a younger guy, uh, Brendan or something like that, I think his name was, and he was from a temporary agency, you know, he was working there, a temp agency guy. And uh, <clears throat> so... Myself and Jack and Brent are standing there and we're just talking and whatever and, and uh, comes over loudspeaker, Jack, please come to the office. And we're like, oh boy, you're in trouble now. You know, give him a hard time. Yeah, you're gonna get it now. And he's laughing, you know, he walks back in and uh, he comes out and he's just like, face is just like pale. And he's going, we're like, you know, what's going on? And he's like, they just fired me what you know here's this guy that just you know revolutionized this place is doing a great job they just fired him and you know we're just like in shock and, they, and then i get called in so i go back and i'm just like you know just in shock you know this guy that really made the place really good um you know and there was different workers there too i'm not i'm not going to get into all that but you know i go back in there and uh, but it was never more than like five people working there at a time I found out later it was because of the OSHA requirements. You know, the, there were so many things that were unsafe there at the boat place. They wanted to keep it under 10 employees because that way then you can't get OSHA coming in and, you know, forcing government regulations on you. But, uh, I mean, they, they had a big staple gun, just to tell you this little story. They had this big old staple gun, and the, the safety part that, you know, where the staple comes out at, the little trap door that's on top of there would fly open. <laughs> So you shoot a staple, and these are big staples, you know, and they go flying across the shop. 
real safe. But um, so they call me back in and they're like, we want to give you Jack's job. We want to make you the foreman. I'm like, me? <laughs> you know, I'm not qualified for this. I do not want to be the foreman of this place. By that time, it was just like a headache going into the place. I was just, every day I drove in there, we worked four 10-hour days, and then we'd have three days off. And, you know, I started work at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning. So I'd be driving in like 5.30 in the morning and just going, I hate this job, I hate this job. <laughs> and so, you know, they fired Jack, and I was like, and they were like, yeah, we want to have you, you know, as a foreman. We're going to hire some Amish, you know, and stuff because they work for low wages and no health insurance either. So uh, they're like, you know, and they don't care about safety regula regulations either so or safe equipment. Um, so they're like, you know, yeah, we want to make you. And I was just like, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm leaving. And they were just like, okay, you know. So I went and I got my stuff, my tools and things. I had a couple other things there, and I'd throw them in the back of my truck, and I'm like, see ya. And uh, the guy that was working there from the temp agency, he was like, I guess this doesn't look good for me either. I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> see ya. Bye. And so later on, I found out that they came out, and they told him, yeah, you're done too. So they just like in one day, just, just, and the business went under after that. So weird. But, uh. Never did quite understand all that, but uh, whatever. I found out also, too, the guy Jeff, the son-in-law of the Dale Mellinger that, that owned the place, um, this guy Jeff was actually wanted for, like, fraud or something. He's, like, running from the law or something now. <laughs> Nothing but the best. But um, so I get home, and uh, I was living at my parents' place at the time and everything, and, and I'm just, like, I had been saving up money and buying some woodworking equipment you know in my spare time and uh so i just decided i was like i'm gonna go full time as a wood turner and so i told my dad and he just about you know flipped out you walked out of your job you know you know better than to do that and everything and but uh he eventually you know was okay with it and he said okay you know well we'll get you a tax number and we'll you know see what we can do here and so i started my job as a wood turner, professional wood turner. And I'd already been learning, I'd already been practicing and things, but I thought, you know, this will be interesting. I'm gonna make money, you know, as a wood turner. And that's what this album's mostly about. So I'm gonna show a bunch of pictures here. Um, here you can see, I'll do it this way. Uh, I don't want the address and the phone number to be exposed there. Cause I don't know, I know that there's people living there now. We. You know, my parents don't live at this address anymore, but uh, this is, you know, my original business card. It looks like wood here, you know. Denlinger's Fine Wood Turning. That's, this right here is my initials, B and then a D, and then there's a T going down through it. So uh, that was my insignia that I put on all of my work on the bottom of them. I don't even think I have anything here right now, wood turning wise. Just trying to think if most of my stuff was either sold or given away, but anyhow, so... I decided that I would go into business as a wood turner and sell my work through art galleries and craft shops and at art shows and craft shows and everything. And so uh, that was 1997 when I went into that. Um, right here, just to show you some different pictures, this is a peach bowl. With this, this is the bark edge here, natural edge peach bowl. It was turned to a 1 8 inch thick wall thickness. Um, this is more advanced work that this wasn't early on this type of stuff down here we have a coca bola an exotic hardwood again eighth inch wall thickness bowl there um, i was taking a lot of my pictures back then not in the professional studio look of the a lot of the art world but out of nature and things just you know i was later told that's not proper for wood turning and so whatever but this is a myrtle burl sort of a platter um, 15 inches in, you know, diameter, essentially there. And, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Here's one. My wife just, thank you. Just to show you a little example of one of the pieces that I made. This is a hollow turning here, one of the few that I have left anymore. But there on the back, you can see this is 1999 uh, when I made this one. It's got some scuffs on it there, but there's the insignia. So there you can see it. This is a tulip poplar is what that's made out of. Okay. 
Oh, you know what? Get the get the candlesticks out of the bottom thing there. I can show you that too. But uh huh. Yeah, it was in your mind, all right. I'm sure. This we'll get both of them. Here's another peach, sort of a, a bowl, kind of a deep, almost like a, a vase or something. This is one of the better ones in my collection that I did. This is a a burl. There's the outside of it right there. Kind of you see these big cancerous looking growths on the side of a tree. They're actually really beautiful inside. Show you some more of that in a, in a minute or two here. This is a black cherry. And um, just set them right here. I'll get to that in a minute. Danke. But anyhow, um, this is black cherry. Again, an eighth inch wall thickness. And I remember I took this exact piece down to the Wood Turning Center in Philadelphia. The guy there, Albert Lakoff, I think his name is. And I showed it to him and he was just holding it. He was like, wow, this is really good. And he said, I remember he told me, he said, your work is technically excellent, but you need to come up with something that's unique, uniquely yours to make it into the art world. Very true. You know, I was just, I remember he was like, what's your motivation? And back then I was like, I said, I was like, to make money. <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. But he's like, what's the thing that inspires you? What is, what's your inspiration as an artist? And I was like, to make a living, <laughs> you know, that's what it was back then. But, uh, you know, I was just trying to make quality work that I could sell, but the Lord had other plans for my life, which, uh, we'll get into as we continue. This is wood right here called quilted maple. Uh, if a wood is distressed the way it, it grows, uh, it'll it'll get unique figuring in the in the wood, and uh, this was actually an instrument piece of instrument grade quilted maple. It's very very beautiful that rippled effect in the wood, and it's completely smooth. I didn't this isn't carved or anything. It's the grain of the wood. It's very beautiful. There you have a uh, canary wood, another bowl that I had made that's got a thicker wall thickness. Down here we have I call these things farce flowers. They, this was made out of mulberry. Um, uh, kind of a difficult thing to turn that that stem there is about an eighth um, maybe about uh, a little bit less than a quarter inch in diameter that you know stem there that on that goblet this is a piece of wengi or wenge depending on how you want to say it from Africa an African hardwood there's no stain or no dye or anything on that that's just completely a clear finish on there um, and I carved the, the rim of this platter. That's what the wood looks like in there. Very, very hard wood. Um, natural edge peach bowl. This is a cherry burl bowl. I took a picture of it on top of this burl cut in half. You can see what the burls look like. They're kind of that thing, but you can see the grain of the wood is, is very unique, very interesting. Um, again, a tulip poplar platter. This is kind of a weird one here. Um, grain dyed maple. Uh, you, you basically just dye the different, you know, colors of the maple and things there. Kind of an interesting piece. Um, this is box elder. This uh, kind of a wide bowl. <clears throat> here you have uh, figured maple. Little bowl, eighth inch thick wall thickness. Uh, very difficult. It's kind of a unique thing when you actually turn a bowl to the eighth inch thick wall thickness, especially if it's green, like it's just, it's not kiln dried or something, um, just fresh from the tree. It has a lot of moisture in it. And when you turn down to an eighth inch thick wall thickness, the way that you turn it is you're not using your calibers the whole time. You actually put a light against the, where you're turning at. And I'll show pictures of me wood turning here in a little bit. And uh, you, you actually go by the light that comes through the wood becomes translucent and you can actually see it'll be darker kind of an orange red and it'll turn yellow where it's at that eighth inch thick wall thickness um, very unique this is a, a bowl here uh, one of the nicer ones I actually gave this to some uh, brother and sister in the Lord um, that are friends of the ministry this is mahogany and it's got a black dyed exterior there's my first wood turning right there. This is pine. Uh, there's a bunch of pine boards glued together. This is the first one I made in, in high school in my wood shop class. It's where I first discovered wood turning, how much I loved wood turning. This is another one I made in high school. This is a cedar, uh, eastern red cedar. 
uh, stump that I cut it. You can, can't really see the line too good right there, but it's hollow inside. It's like a little box. I still have that one. I still have both of these in my private collection. I'm sure they're worth millions of dollars by now. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> this is a black cherry multiple axis uh, goblet. Um, these are turned on different axes, so you'd have, you know, this it turn, you know, this way on the lathe, and then you remount it and you turn it this way on the lathe. Yeah, pretty difficult actually. And then you turn this one on another axis, so it's three different axes that you turn that on. Um, down here is a figured black cherry, uh, kind of an end table that I'd made in high school. Uh, There's a uh, box out of a spalted cherry. Spalted means it's, it's got some uh, fungal growth in it, so it has a darker look. But right there, you pull this top part off and it's hollow inside. They call them boxes in the wood turning world. Um, this is kind of a unique thing here. There was a big stump at the property where I grew up, a huge big oak stump, and I carved a solid kind of a high back chair out of the oak stump. And uh, so it was chainsaw carved and then carved with other tools and things. But it was, this is all one solid, huge, big piece of oak. Uh, down here, I made this coffee table for my sister and her husband um, for their wedding present. It's made out of black walnut. And I, the only thing that's unnatural, quote unquote, on it is the bark edge here. I dyed black just for contrast. But uh, this is... This is all totally natural. It had a kind of a tongue oil finish on it. Um, all joinery in here and stuff like this. And, and uh, they still have it, as far as I know. Um, here I actually had a, a friend of mine, their fan blades on their fan in their living room, they wanted, wanted them to be replaced. So being artistic, I had to make some out of, this is a purple heart from Brazil. And uh, it's bird's eye maple inlay so kind of exotic for fan blades but you know i like that kind of thing this is larch western larch we went out uh, my brother older brother was living in montana for a little while and there was a, a burl out there on a tree when we went out to visit him so i talked him into cutting the burl off of the tree and i actually smuggled it home in my suitcase so <laughs> i was quite fanatical about burls for a long long time uh, there's a little chainsaw carving I made at a friend's cabin of a little hawk sitting there. Uh, Eastern red cedar coffee table. Uh, they don't normally get that wide, Eastern red cedars. Um, there's one I showed earlier. That's kind of the more of the studio type of setting. This is a sassafras, actually, a natural edge bowl. It, it's kind of a weird orange colored bark. You know, on the on the outside it'll look you know kind of a grayish brown but when you cut into it, it the bark is actually orange so it's kind of a pretty thing here i am up here back in the old days um turning on my custom lathe this was one i had it could turn up to four feet in diameter i actually have a video of myself on youtube here an old old video of me turning perpendicular wood turning um sort of an artistic uh, thing there i did very dangerous but uh it could turn, it had a three horsepower uh, Baldor motor on it and 220 volt electricity for you if you're interested in that stuff. But it could turn, I mean, I had a lot of power. And uh, I was turning a big beach, spalted beach bowl there. Um, down here, was, this is figured purple heart with a grain dyed rim on it. Uh, a peach natural edge bowl. Down here we have uh, candlesticks turned on multiple axes. Uh, there, this was uh, figured maple and then lace wood, Brazilian lace wood bases on them like that, triangular. Uh, this is a ailanthus, actually, tree of heaven, a, locally, a local uh, hardwood, kind of a weed tree, actually, but I made this big bowl out of it. Uh, again, an eighth inch thick wall thickness. Um, down here we have a dogwood burl. These are, you know, uh, little bark inclusion areas in here and stuff like this with a lacewood base to it. Um, 
that was a difficult piece to turn because when you're when you have your tool down in there and this thing's spinning around you know when you're carving it out um, it was really hard with those bark inclusions in there to, to keep the tool straight um, I just hold it here for a minute this is an example too of uh, two little snowmen candlesticks I sold a lot of these um, these are spindle turn on a spindle in other words instead of like a bowl where you're turning just a face plate turning um, you actually do this between centers you know it has a spur drive here and over here it has a, a kind of a tail center and you turn these things and then I have it hollowed out you can put a candlestick in there um, but you turn the hat and then you dye it brown and dye it red here then brown then you I would put the face and the buttons on with the marker and then these are green bases on them and again I have the uh, my insignia and the date so there you can see the close-up of the snowman candlestick these are made out of tulip poplar a little bit of a knot there just for interest and character and things but um, this is a matched set so but that's uh, just an example of the kind of things I used to do I used to do a lot of uh, wooden spinning tops I don't have any of those right now I made hundreds of those but uh, just you know I spent a lot of time out in my shop um, at Peach Lane then also when I moved to Kleinfeldersville I was there too doing a lot of that here you have a bowl that's made out of figured mahogany canary wood I showed this one earlier just different angle of it myrtle burl there I showed that earlier this one another challenge I like to do a lot in wood turning was uh, I would take people's trash wood and turn them into works of art you know bowls and things some uh, people actually brought up uh, some scrap pine that they had cut this big pine tree down and they were just bringing up these big blocks of wood and throwing them on our property my dad let them do that and I went out and I got one of these big blocks of pine and I turned it into a bowl and it actually turned out pretty beautiful very nice uh, bowl down here is a maple burl uh, the big burl carving that I had done earlier I'd shown pictures of um, this is part of the inside of that actually is a uh, very very beautiful wood uh, how much more of this I'll show here here's a better shot of the maple burl that I did last thing I know this thing was actually in a museum someplace so I get this phone call from the curator of this museum and she's like are you the one that did this burl carving and I was like yeah and she said well it's beautiful you know and, and she asked me some questions about it and stuff so I have no idea where the thing is right now uh, that it has my insignia on it plus it also has my full name uh, signed on it so where did it go where is it at right now I have no idea um, but okay just kind of paging through here uh, just to give you an example I don't, don't remember some of these things but um, this is a yeah, it's really dark you can't really see too good coca bola um, hollow turning solid coca bola this one here is wengi with purple heart inlay and then wengi down here this one sold at a gallery for four hundred dollars so just to give you an idea the um, big maple burl carving the last time that I knew that it had sold it uh, sold for twelve hundred dollars so that's the kind of money I was making back in those days um, it's pretty good money there's the cedar eastern red cedar uh, coffee table that I had made natural edge coffee table is what that's called uh, kind of a contemporary piece here made with perpendicular turning this technique I came up with uh, back in the day it was an ailanthus and actually had this uh, vine growing around the tree and the tree grew around the vine and then I, I turned it on this side and then on the other and then up top here too it was, this is a difficult piece to do very difficult um, down here was a wood turning or a wood carving show I should say that I was at that I attended this burl piece that I had um, it got first place in the other category and then second place second uh, best of show so there it is but then you can see my other items here I had for sale um, 
this is a really nice piece too. I'll show this one. This is a western, uh, western red cedar burl, natural edge bowl. Very beautiful piece. This is zebra wood, a little bowl made out of zebra wood. Uh, this is one of the first pieces I sold right when I went into business for myself. This is a um, figured bird's eye maple, a big bowl that I made. There's a green dyed tiger maple. Again, some of the early pictures of some of my early work that I was doing, selling at art shows, craft shows, and things like that. Uh, just different, different pieces. Another picture of it there. Um, I just had these laid out on a bed at my parents' home there. Some of my work that I had done that I took to the show. Um, <clears throat> there's my first lady that I started out on. Ironically, this is the one I still have. I got rid of all my other professional stuff, but uh, little Delta 110 volt, uh, I think three quarter horsepower lathe. But there's that one. There's some of my tools up here. Um, that's how I started out in an old shed. Uh, let's see here. What other pictures do I want to show? There's some pictures of me um, early on. Wood turning. Uh, if you don't know how a wood lathe works, you put a piece of wood on there and it spins it around. You can see up here, there's a chuck right there that grips the wood and then it spins it and then you, you turn it, you put these tools against it and it, it carves the wood like that. Um, here's another shot of another lathe I had and there's me turning. You can see how the tool is, is carving away this portion of wood and the shavings are flying off. Uh, you definitely get covered in wood shavings. There I am with, this is called power sanding. Um, you put a little adhesive disc on here with 80 grit or whatever other grit and then while the lathe, while this piece of wood is spinning, you're sanding it and it's much quicker than just holding the sandpaper against the wood. Uh, so uh, down there I am again working on this custom lathe of mine. I also had a, a big professional Powermatic lathe, which was really a good one, very solid and whatever. Um, let me see here. Another lathe setup I had when I got a little bit more money. I bought this lathe here. Uh, it's called a Nova, I think. Nova lathe, I forget exactly. But there was my sharpening area. I'd sharpen my tools right there. Um, did a lot of work on that. This is dust collection here and then my own little custom made light thing that I could adjust it and move it around. Here I am at one of the craft shows. It's my little canopy thing I had set up there and then my work that was for sale. We'd sell there. Here I'm at another art show that's indoors. Uh, another one down here. There's my sign down there's fine wood turning and um, you know different different things. This is the wood uh, carving show at Kitchen Kettle Village in Intercourse PA. And I was actually demonstrating there. So there's me turning, people watching. I had this little fence thing built so if any of the pieces went flying it wouldn't kill anybody. <laughs> there I am again. Uh, I was making spinning tops while there. And that's where I got the second best of show for my uh, burl carving. And I think that's it for, for that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it for that. Let's see if I can get back to this one picture. Uh, where'd that thing go? But um, that just gives you an idea of, of the kind of work that I was doing as a wood turner. Um, I never did, you know, I wasn't getting rich or anything. Uh, really, really wealthy or anything doing it, but it was, you know, it was, it was decent money. I'd make some pretty good money now and then on some of my pieces. There we go. And uh, so um, I was getting better and better going up with different galleries and everything else, but it was just, it was not very fulfilling. And it was just, it was like, I was getting really tired and, and, you know, what I was really doing is I was looking for the Lord at that point in time in my life. And uh, I just, I, I was not satisfied making things for rich people. And, uh, and I actually went on a mission trip to Honduras and I lived in this extremely wretchedly poor village. And that really changed things for me. And uh, 
I started getting into the creation science thing at that point, you know, talking to some of the people that were on the team. And, you know, because I was a professing Babel building Christian at that point in time. <clears throat> and uh, I came back to America and I'm like thinking, do I really want to continue making art for rich people? And, you know, the answer to that was no, I don't. And so I started to really look hard for the Lord at that point in time. And it was around that time I got saved. And after I got saved, my desires for wood turning and everything really started to go downhill. And I was still making things. I was still making a lot of the production type of stuff like this. And, um, you know, just doing my best to, to earn a living and things. And, and I was a single guy, so it wasn't like I had a family to provide for or anything. And, uh, but I really started to spend my money, instead of the motorcycles and the cars and everything else, I started to spend my money on this. <laughs> Um, when I was, when I first got saved, I think I had one or two books in my entire collection. Uh, well, no, I shouldn't say that because I had all these wood turning books down here. Still a lot of the, the bottom shelf, you can't see it, but it's a lot of my wood turning books and things and woodworking and stuff like that. I was very much into that. But uh, as far as, uh, books on other subjects, yeah, I didn't have very many. Um, but I really started to shift and I started to get books about the Bible and things like that. And um, so that's what I really got into. Uh, during this time period, I also started to study the thing of logging, of uh, a lot of the old ways of timber framing and and a lot of other things. Uh, again, I can't get into all of it. Uh, it just take too long. Um, but <clears throat> uh, I started to actually make a living in logging. And... Um, so, and that was along with the wood turning. I didn't quit wood turning and do logging. Uh, instead, I was doing both. Uh, just another way to make some extra money. And um, I'll show you some of my logging uh, records here. I mean, I have some videos of, of me, you know, logging, felling, you know, timber and stuff. But uh, just to show, show that I was actually selling two sawmills. Um, to show you some of the timber sale type of stuff here. Um, okay, I'll show you this first of all. This is here we have Weber Incorporated. Um, and they had poplar, basswood, red oak, black oak, white oak, chestnut oak, beech, ash, all these other ones down through here. And they tell you basically um, what your, you know, the, the uh, uh, prices and things like that. And then you have the different grades of it and stuff in here. Number one, number 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 3A, uh, different things. Uh, no defects allowed. Um, must have minimum of two clear faces. In other words, if there's branch knot holes and, or knots and things like that, or if there's some twist to it or whatever else. But uh, this is, you know, that shows you what the timber classification was. But then this here um, shows some of the logs, the grades and things like that. Poplar, a lot of poplar. I was doing tulip poplar and uh, how much you're making per log. And there's your length, you know, 12 foot logs, 16 foot logs. They wanted them bucked to this. I know some people, like here in Maine, I see a lot of tree, you know, full length, you know, and stuff. But uh, down there, it was they wanted them bucked to eight, anywhere from eight to 16 feet. Um, <clears throat> they used shorter trucks, you know, because there's more traffic down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania than up here. But uh, you can see some of the mostly poplar and the, the prices that I was getting for some of these logs and things. Um, just kind of show you a couple more here. I'm not going to show all these files and things, but uh, there's a total for the one kind of money that I was making there on this thing. And of course, you know, you, the money goes to the landowner too. But as a logger, you get a you know a decent percentage of that. Um, <clears throat> just trying to find one here that's actually really worth something good you know for some of the here's some more prices and things uh, 
you know, there's some of this is getting up there pretty good. Uh, number one select and, and 23 inch diameter, 16 foot length, 361 uh, feet there, board feet. Um, rate 76 cents per board foot, so you get 274.36. So, uh, just see if there's anything else here I want to show. Again, there's a total, you know. So, um, like I said, there's there's a bunch of these records. I'm not going to go over it all, but, you know, pretty good money in logging. And uh, then what I did also, uh, I'll show you a couple pictures here, quick of some of the logging. Um, here's the, I have a video too of some of this logging that I did. Um, there's the Weber truck coming and picking up some of my logs. You know, you can see him loading the logs on there, 16 footers mostly. Uh, you know, just doing a lot of work here. I'm just looking, see if I want to show anything else on here. Um, there's me down there. You know, some of the stuff you can't really see too good. Uh, I think that's about it for that. Um, yeah. But then also what I was doing, here's a, um, I made these firewood racks out of logs and they held a four foot wide, four foot high and eight feet long. That's a cord of firewood, three face cords, 16 to 18 inch length firewood, three rows that are four feet high, eight feet long. Put three of those together, you get four foot wide, four foot high, eight feet long. It's a full cord. So I was selling firewood by the cord. I had a bunch of these cord racks built and I'd sell to people. Um, there's me on top of one of my piles of firewood. I'd go around to where the logging, you know, I'd done some of the logging work and you get tops and things and, or logs that just weren't worth selling to the mill. And I saw them up and split them into firewood. And I was splitting all by hand with, you know, a maul and things, no power splitting. And uh, so I was doing about a cord to two, one to two cords a day, about making 120 or so dollars um, per cord. So pretty good money. Um, and uh, so that's what I was doing, logging and firewood there. But, uh, you know, this, this whole process... Uh, I was doing logging and firewood and doing wood turning um, initially for money, just purely, I just want to make money at this. And then I started to actually, when I got saved, excuse me, got hiccups here. Um, I started to really spend my money on uh, books and things and, and just reading, studying a lot of videos and things like that. Um, and it got to a point where it was like, you know, I really want to do something for the Lord with my life and I, I would really like to be in some kind of ministry, but it did not occur to me to do it full time. Uh, I was thinking to myself, I love working with wood. I love logging. I love doing firewood. Uh, doing ministry full time was not something that I was considering. And uh, I was going to a Baptist Bible building at the time, Liberty Baptist Church, and um, and I had spoken different times on the Bible version issue before then, and I was, you know, getting used to speaking in front of people and everything else, and, and uh, you know, going out door to door and whatever else at that point in time. I was a very fervent Baptist at that point in time. And uh, the Lord really started working on me about the thing of doing a video, because I had seen uh, Peter Ruckman, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman's study called What's the Difference? And he actually had a... Uh, you know, he'd show these Bibles and stuff and he'd show it on camera, you know, here's where it's wrong and here's, you know, look, it's right there, you can see it. And I thought to myself, you know, it'd be really good to have this on video where you can actually show people, you know, overhead camera kind of a thing. Of course, I didn't have an overhead camera, I just bought a camera and put it on a tripod and I'd hold stuff up like this. And um, I thought to myself, you know, this would be a good thing to do. So I made my very first video and I was giving them to people. Um, from NIV to KJV is what it was. Very, very poorly done, to be quite frank. I had no idea how to do video editing. I, I had 
gone out and bought a JVC Averio camera, just a little cheap thing. And I mean, it was, it was a very poorly done video. But I, I put a lot of time and research into the thing, and I thought, hey, this might really help people. And so uh, different people said, you know, you got to get this thing out there. You got to sell these things. And I'm like, how can I do that? And, and I contacted my accountant, uh, who would, I dealt with for years with the wood turning stuff. And I said, am I allowed to sell DVDs? And she said, it's a taxable thing and stuff like that, you know, and, and yeah, go ahead. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll sell DVDs. So I started to sell these videos originally through Gail Ripplinger's uh, ministry. And, you know, I uh, can't think if I did YouTube at first or if I did the redid. At some point in time, I redid the video from NIV to KJV. I have it up online now. Um, but I redid it, made it a little bit more professional. And I also did uh, the real or the ridiculous Bible perversions of the new age. And I started to get, uh, somebody told me about YouTube. I started putting videos on YouTube. And, um, and I was still, I did not consider myself full-time in ministry because I thought, well, you know, I still want to do the wood turning thing. I still had a professional lathe. I had all my shops set up and everything. And, um, and so I was like, you know, well, I'm just going to do this ministry thing on the side. Well, the Lord had other plans. And um, what ended up happening is I started getting people saying, hey, you know, this video is really good. These videos you've put out, they're great. Um, originally, I had a brother in Australia, actually. And he contacted me and he said, uh, I'd like to donate to your ministry. And I'm like, donate to my ministry? What? Huh? Donate? What's a, what's a donation? I don't you know. I don't know how to do this stuff. Again, contacted the uh, accountant, and she said, "Is she said if you're five hundred one c three, you can take donations, and you can tell people here's you give them a receipt, and they can r write it off and stuff." Well, I'd heard stuff about five hundred one c three. I didn't know everything about it, but I was like, I don't want to be five hundred one c three. And she said, "Well, then it's then you tell people it's not tax deductible. It's a gift to the ministry." And then it's it's you know that's an, an income that is on the side of of your logging slash wood turning and it's something that's not a that's not a taxable type of a thing but you know living with gifts from people is very sporadic it's it's not very certain i mean it can go down it can go up which we're going to see here in the bible about that in just a minute but um the point is, it was like, okay, you can take donations. So I started to take donations. And, you know, it was like, okay, well, you know, and he said, could, you know, could you get a PayPal donation button thing? So I looked into that. I got a PayPal account and all the other stuff. And uh, that was really how it got started. And I just decided, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to continue making DVDs. And I'm going to tr try to get these DVDs done and everything and, and get as many as I can and sell them along with my wood turnings being sold at galleries because I was doing both. And I started to see that when I would be putting videos on YouTube, I was also doing Sermon Audio way back then. This is 2008, 2009. I was actually on Sermon Audio before I was on YouTube. The original Sermon Audio thing was Bible Believers Fellowship, which is no more. Uh, and of course, Sermon Audio is no more for me because I got kicked off of there. Um, uh, for telling people how to have a child at home, you know, go figure. But uh, because Joseph and Mary didn't do anything like that, but uh, so what happened is uh, I started to see, hey, there's a great need to get truth out online, and people are saying, hey, could you do a study on this? Could you do a study on that? And so I started to do more research, and it was like people were going, wow, I've never heard preaching like this before, and I'm going. Huh? You know, and the Lord just really opened up doors for me to preach on a lot of different subjects and, uh, you know, just really, um, you know, we just really, it just really took off. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it just really went crazy. And, and now we have over 930 videos available for free uh, right here on YouTube. And you know, they're mirrored on other channels, they're on other websites now, they're all over the place. I have a lot of them referenced in my, at my ministry website, kingjamesvideoministries.com. They're in the video section. Uh, and I saw that, you know, I can either make all this stuff, put it all on DVD, and try to sell it, and, and I've never copyrighted anything. Um, and I thought I could do that and try to make this thing about 
you know, just making a lot of money and things and selling product. But I thought, you know, I see, I'd rather spend my time, uh, instead of trying to produce all these DVDs and I have all the equipment to do it, I have the DVD duplicator and I have the printers and I have all the other stuff. But that stuff takes time and it takes me away from doing more videos. And also, you know, selling the videos, okay, it's an income, but it also takes me away from doing more video. And so it just, Lord kind of impressed on me, you know, there's not going to be much time here for the Bible-believing Christians to be bringing out truth. So I've just been like, since 2008, I've been really pushing hard. I shouldn't say 2008 because I was still kind of on the fence of what to do there. But 2009 was really the first year I really started to push hard getting stuff out on YouTube, answering a lot of the false teachings out there and things too. And um, since then, I've been working just nonstop. And the Lord has provided for me, uh, and now my wife and our son, He's provided for me, you know, and that I can stay in the ministry. Um, but there's a key to that. I'm going to talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, how you do full-time ministry. How, why the Lord has allowed us to continue full-time. Um, because I, I never have said, I'm done with this over here. You know, I'm saying with the wood turning. You know, I still am technically a wood turner. I still have all the equipment. I don't have my big lathes anymore, but I have my little one, and I can still turn wood. I might even do that in the future in a video. I'm not sure. I might do that. Don't know yet.